Hi, everybody. I have the coolest guest lined up for you. She's a Reiki master. If you don't know what that is, we'll probably talk about it. But she is also a trauma therapist and has a few other things up her sleeve. The purpose of bringing her on as a guest today is to talk about her expertise in an area that I'm very interested in, the vagus nerve and how it relates to the chakras. Don't go away. This is going to be of interest to you because it's going to show you how to clear trauma and how to connect more clearly with the greater reality, which is certainly always my greatest goal as a medium. But before we get too far into this, let me bring her on. CJ Llewellyn, welcome to the show. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me on, Suzanne. I'm, I'm, I've been following you for years. <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. Well, you're a little bit of a new face in, in the crowd here. I know you through the Shift Network yes. and uh, I've heard beautiful things about you. And you and I recently recorded a beautiful uh, video for the Shift Network and I loved your energy. So just thrilled to have you here. Why don't you just start by telling us a little more about your work just in general before we dive into vagus nerve and chakras and how you came to do this work? I, I came to do this work. Um, I, I had a couple of other careers before this. What were those? I, I love to hear the oh, you, Okay. <laughs> I was a journalist for years. And then I was a, I was a stay home mom writing fiction. And then thought, you know, something, something else is driving me. And I decided this was the, going back and getting my degree, my advanced degree in counseling was it. I just had always wanted to understand a deeper aspect of our, of our humanness. Um, and that took me on a journey of working with trauma. I worked a lot with women. I kind of went in with this vague, well, all I know is I want to work with women. Unfortunately, when we work with women, we're dealing with a lot of trauma. And that just set me on this course of wanting to know more uh, wanting to understand how, how can I help? How can, how can we clear this from our systems? Um, so I developed all sorts of training. And then as I was doing a lot of my work in private practice, I also, by the way, I'll throw this into the mix here. Uh, I jokingly say my grown up um, camp, the one that I like to go to in the summer was a spiritualist camp. <laughs> Lilydale, right? Yes, it is. And, and we've talked about that off the air. So, you know, it's like, how confusing can I get? Throw a, a few more things into the, the pile. So I've always had that, that's that just knowing and that that guidance from spirit. And for those who aren't familiar, Lilydale is is a spiritualist camp, like she said, but where mediums have homes and cottages, people go for readings. And they do classes there and large gatherings, spiritual workshops all the time. And it's where I first started my journey back in 2007 and actually ended up writing the biography of two Lily Dale mediums, Anne Gaiman and Janet Nohavik, who I believe you knew. Two brilliant women. Brilliant yeah. women. Yes. Legendary. I'm surprised I didn't run into you there. <laughs> So I, I only spent a couple of weeks there at a, you know, one week, one week and been back maybe four or five times, but it's very, very interesting and well visited in the summer. It absolutely is. I haven't been there since COVID. Um, just life has been, I've been doing this a lot. So it's time for me to go back to my grown up summer camp soon. <laughs> that That's what I would call it. When my son would go off to his camp in the summer, I'm like, I'm going to my camp now. <laughs> ask you because we really didn't talk about it much other than that we have that connection did you go out of curiosity or because you developed uh, your own ability to connect with spirits well I grew up seeing people at around my bed as a child oh. I've always had that ability um and literal seeing sometimes and it got, I was a child I was so afraid of it I said take this away I don't want to see it and they did so I sense it still, but I, I very seldom will see now. Uh, it was very overwhelming when you're a child and you're looking up and I'm jokingly out of full respect saying, you know, when you wake up and you see dead people at your, at your bed is a little uh, disconcerting. So um, my, I had a friend of mine, I actually am from Buffalo, New York. While I lived there growing up, never heard of Lilydale. I live down in the Southeast now and a friend of mine started going 
how did I miss this? So over the years, I started going too. So it just, it feels like home. It's my camp. It's that place I get to go and, and just uh, be with spirit. But did you turn it back on then? And, and if so, do you see spirits at will or just willy nilly? Um, I, because, you know, once you get trained, you're able to, to manage it a little bit better. I do a lot of work just tapping into my own guides. Cause I feel like if I can utilize their guidance while I'm doing this work, you know, helping people work through their, their trauma, that is to me the best way to be able to do that. Of course I connect to those. My, I have had loved ones die too. Um, you know, I will connect to them in certain ways. And every once in a while, I have a, a dear friend who just lost her mom. And my friends are used to this. I said, don't worry, your dad's right there. She's good, you know, and it just brings so much comfort. I'm getting moved. Um, I, you know, it just brings so much comfort to, to the person. And this isn't someone who necessarily does that work, but they certainly know that I have that ability. So I love when I can just randomly bring comfort to a friend or even just a coworker. Well, how about when you're doing trauma therapy for someone? I have, we have another friend, Colleen Smith, who is a, a licensed therapist, and she is a professional medium doing both work and sometimes integrates the two. When you're doing trauma work with someone, do their loved ones drop in on you? They do. I'll tell a, a, a story that uh, was not planned. Um, I was in the middle of some very deep trauma processing, doing some EMDR with a client. This was years ago, so I think I can bring this up as an example. And I just, I kept this, this name kept coming to my head this, and I couldn't say my client's name. And we'd been working together for a long time. It was like, why am I, I can't, it's blocked. I couldn't say my client's name. And I finally just said, who is, I think it was Phyllis. Who is Phyllis? And she said, that's my grandmother. Uh -huh. I'm like, okay, she's here. <laughs> and I never, you know, I don't bring that into the room all the time because when you're a therapist, you have to meet people where they're at, mm -hmm. as your friend would tell you too, right? So some people are not coming in with that belief system at all. And I just keep it to myself but it may guide me in some ways. I've also seen where sometimes if I bring that forward too much, the, the work changes. Mm. It's like, see it in their eyes. There's, they're waiting for me to say what they, what they see in me, you know? So it's a different, it's a different dynamic when you're reading for somebody versus when you are in the room being present as a therapist for them. So I, I try to keep it separate, but every once in a while, it'll bleed over that yeah. way. <laughs> well, and what I find very interesting then is it's very clear that mediumship is a calling because you had you had this ability since a child, but you didn't pursue that. You were called to do this trauma therapy work. Yes. Yeah. I was joking with you that when we when I did my interview with you a couple of weeks ago, you know, it was like I kept saying, but I want to, and spirit was like, no, oh, okay, fine. But okay. <laughs> you wanted to what? I want to be a medium. I want to, okay, this is where I'm so, okay. <laughs> so I kept getting guided to this, but this is what evolved from it mm -hmm. is my, you know, my ability to see how uh, we process trauma in ways that, you know, this is a general term, are very meta metaphysical, are very uh, soul guided. So I'm very thankful I listen to my guides to go in this direction because I'm able to apply both of those things. Yeah, beautiful. The knowledge of spirit, but also knowing that what I'm helping people do is drop down into that soul energy um, without even having to use those terms for some people who don't use those, you know, have that, that schema, you know, uh, we're still doing soul work. We're still doing their soul work. But you don't call it soul work. No, I don't. Okay. Um, well, let's get into that later. I made a note. Okay. I do want to remark, though, that we have a lot of men who tune in and who are watching and listening now. And you mentioned you work mostly with women, but trauma is trauma. Mm -hmm. so anything we say today is going to help everybody, correct? Absolutely. And foundationally, I started working at a women's center, but I work, I have in my private practice, I have men and women. 
Um, so it's, it's trauma is trauma. Uh, and it, and it stores in our system. We don't know it, especially when it's been childhood trauma. And it looks as if we are reacting emotionally when we're actually reacting from our neurobiology. Mm, talk about that, please. So those times when people overreact, oh, I don't know what got into me. Oh, I shouldn't have yelled. Oh my gosh, I just shut down. What I find so freeing is when I can explain to them, that's, that's your vagus nerve. That's your nervous system. When Before we come into this world, when we are in utero, we are taking in information as the human part of us through our nervous system. We have two parts of us. We have the spirit that comes in. Then we're trying to maneuver through our lives in these human containers, right? We've talked, you know, you've, you talk about that all the time, um, right? And it's hard. It, it truly is that we are spiritual beings having that human experience. The more we can understand what that human experience through our body, in this case, through our nervous system, is doing for us, we can manage it better. And then we can access our soul. Which, by the way, through my writing and through this work, I, I use the S word a lot more, right? The soul word. <laughs> The soul yeah. word. I, I, it's like, yes, I can finally use it when I'm, when I'm working with my clients, I don't so much. So I do want to know that here's where that comes up now then. So it, I guess it, what you're, what I'm hearing is you're, you don't want to turn people off by using these terms, but you want to help them benefit from it anyway. So what is it you, what words do you use to discuss the soul? So what I would do, I'm, I'm a lot of internal family systems trained and within that, there's the discussion that we have multiple personalities. We have these little kids and they're trying to work it out for us. And the more they can be unburdened, right? The more they can realize, oh, I'm just the kid trying to get this adult thing done. I can relax now. The more we can access self energy. So that becomes a... Uh, it becomes a term that any single person that I'm working with can um, embrace in their own way. Hmm. Um, Self so they're not coming to me with my belief system in place. I am working around whatever, whatever their belief system, whatever their construct is. Okay. All right. So this will be of interest to everybody then because we all get triggered in some way. Is that, I even heard that the word triggered is one we need to stay away from. Is there anything to that? You know, it's, it's a language. And, you know, in other words, there's, I believe in, in helping people develop language around what's happening. So if trigger is one of their words, then that is fine, right? This, this whole shock to the system or this whole overreact, I keep using my air quotes here, um, overreaction. <laughs> uh, I'm going to break out and dance with my, <laughs> um, we feel overreactive in situations or even underreactive. Um, if they can utilize a language that helps them just describe the moment, then, then that's fine. Um, I don't think that there, to me, there doesn't seem to be one way or the other with that. Um, so what happens with us is we become programmed right? We're humans. I'm jumping, I'm jumping to the whole schema here. We come in, we have this human form. We're trying to adjust to it. We don't even know it because we have a little bit of that amnesia, right? Because we're trying to get used to this world, this, this experience. When we're little, we're gauging our world based on how we are being raised. And let me just back up a sec, just for those who didn't catch that amnesia as to the fact that we are souls, we forget we're souls is what Thank you. you. Yes, absolutely. You know, we, we, we have inklings. Some people have a little bit more inkling than other, but for the most part, we're, we're choosing this experience. So we're, we're, there's a little dichotomy right off the bat, right? It's like, well, I know that there's something bigger out there, but I don't know what it is. And this is what I know. So we, we form our lives based on this blueprint early on 
of how we were raised, what our information was, how we engage in the world, how safe we were, right? How our parents treated us. Some of us had wonderful, loving parents with nice, healthy boundaries, and a lot of us didn't. Um, so then we have this, I call it the blueprint. We have this blueprint. It's imprinted in here. And then we go out into the world and realize, oh, how I learned to do that is not working out here. Oh my gosh, I'm coping in this way. I'm overreacting. I'm not safe. We don't think in terms of safety in our system, right? But safety is the key to everything. Safety is the key to spirituality. Because when we can feel safe in our bodies, we can access us, our light, and we can access, here we go, our guides, everything around us. I have to tell you what just happened minutes before coming up here to interview you. And we were finishing lunch and we love to give our dogs a teeny bit of chicken after every meal, after lunch, after lunch. So I was the one chosen to give it to them. And the Tupperware lid from the chicken container fell onto our little dog, Nellie. And she went scooting off under the table. Now, clearly minor, minor trauma, what you're talking about. But I thought, you know, I tried to get her back to that spot to eat the chicken and she wouldn't come back. And I thought, now she's going to relate this spot with not being safe. You're talking about not being safe. So I literally asked my guides, how do I make her feel safe? Because I picked her up and I'm trying to talk to her soul. It wasn't getting through. And all of a sudden I heard, you get down on the floor where she was. So I sat in the exact spot where the thing fell on her. And I said, look, it's safe to sit here. And she came right over and ate the Oh chicken. my gosh. I just thought that was so cute. But it's, yeah. And that's how we are. Yeah. It's yeah. just how we are. We register. Oops, not going there again. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Safe. Interesting. Yeah. So my guy, Brenda, said that most of us are walking wounded. And so I said trauma is trauma, but some people truly went through terrible trauma, but every one of us can remember some kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. Does all of it get lodged in the energetic system? I think it, there's also, uh, yes, that would be the general question. If you think about it, birth is trauma. Mm -hmm. We are on the cusp of life and death, mother and child in those moments. Those are very traumatic moments. So, so being human has with it components of danger. Um, we again could, so there's something called developmental trauma. That's when we uh, have those bad insecure experiences, but we could have the most wonderful attached, right? Loving um, experiences growing up and then have a horrible car accident, right? Mm -hmm. That's generally called like a single event. And then we don't want to get in the car, you know, so any th things can things can happen along the way. Sometimes are some people's central nervous systems are more resilient than others. Um, some of that has to do with how the, if they had a mom like you that went and sat down and said, come on over here. It's safe. Look at me. Right. That's helping in this case, your puppy get secure again. Um, so that's helping form resilience. That's a great sort of everyday experience, right? Where you saw her reaction and you brought her back to safety. And by the way, holding onto her and hugging her, your nervous system was regulating with hers, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Yeah. But so let's move then to the subject of your book chakras and the vagus nerve. This is what drew me to you because I teach, in fact, in my new book that's now out uh, for pre-order, The Awakened Way, Living a Divinely Guided Life, there's an actual practice called vagus nerve breathing, which anybody who's taken my shift network classes or any of my classes knows about how to use the breath to calm down. Tell us about the vagus nerve and why you connected it with the chakras. This is an actual physical or material body mm -hmm. concept. And this is an energy body concept. So this is a nice, unique combination. I started to see it. I, I actually was probably always seeing it because again, how I sort of think of the world, I was seeing the energies. When we do 
uh, a trauma processing modality. I hope that doesn't, you know, process the different, uh, different ways of going about helping to actually work through the trauma. Um, it is the body mind work works the trauma through and out of the central nervous system because, of, you know, well, I, I won't get into that too much. So then I started to see that, wow, this person's having this memory in there. I put my hand down on my root chakra. You can't see that. Um, there's this early childhood memory that she doesn't have up here that she's feeling in her body. And she's saying, oh, she's putting her hand on her root chakra or she's seeing colors. I'm just saying he or she seeing colors. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's really early childhood stuff, that's root chakra. That's very much, right? Survival, the beginnings. Um, or I would see, um, I would start to see them maybe holding on to their solar plexus right near our belly button, right? I mean, not our solar plexus, our, our um, sacral chakra. And they'd be talking about this memory they were having, maybe that was uh, a, a, a scary memory with someone that was taking care of them or hurting them or something. I'm thinking, my gosh, that's relationship. That's early attachment, right? It's the psychobabble word, but it's like how we learn to connect. Or I would be watching them with identity issues and they'd be holding onto their, their solar plexus. I call it the dimension of mind. I, bre I break it down in the book with these different dimensions. I don't use the Sanskrit terms because that's just another arc of learning <laughs> that I'd be throwing at somebody. And then when we get into these areas of the chakras, and I will break down, by the way, in a second, the three branches of safety in our vagus nerve. Then I would see them maybe clearing. They might have some broken heart experience in here, but through the breath, through bilateral stimulation, they would start clearing in, in this area of their body. And this, by the way, is our safety branch of the vagus nerve. So I was just sort of watching, the sh anybody who does any energy work will tell you, the chakras, the, 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 the energies move, right? But that was seeing them align with what I know to be the vagus nerve through polyvagal theory, um, which is, it's a cool theory. I'll, I'll break it down in a second. Um, like, oh my gosh, wait, there's, there's an alignment between this etheric, I keep using those air quotes, but those etheric energies and our sort of gross energies of the vagus nerve, gross as in biology, gross, you know, I'm like, this is a thing. And so I started writing the book <laughs> just in the way that I was seeing it. Um, and when I, I've done some presentations with other trauma therapists and I tell them it's about it, listening to these energies and forming as we're going through with however we've learned to process the trauma. So we're listening to how they're experiencing it in their bodies even deeper. So knowing these different aspects, these dimensions of these chakras that represent different aspects of us helps us really stay present to and helps our uh, processing with our with our clients a little deeper. We so don't I'm have familiar, to I'm familiar with everything. the chakras. If I could say, I, I know the seven chakras and how they relate to different issues in our lives and organs in that area, but I still don't get the connection with the vagus nerve. So could you go back to vagus nerve 101, tell everybody what it is, and then explain this connection you identified? Absolutely. So Vegas in Latin means wandering. And I actually switched out. I had, a, I have a poster of the Vegas nerve back here. Oh, uh, I, but I have it right here because I've talked about it and I pictured one big nerve. This is, this is, this is a crazy nerve. <laughs> well, and so what you're looking at is sort of like if I were looking at you and my head was turned, right? Yeah. We have just like the brain, we have two sides of the brain. We have two lobes in the brain. We have two sides of that nerve. I had no idea. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. And it, 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 it connects to every major organ in our body. It's, is it, it, it looks like Spanish moss. I live in South Carolina and it's all, it hangs it down in like a web. The bottom no, part of this scary. nerve, <laughs> yeah, the, the bottom part of this nerve, no wonder it touches yeah. everything. It, it just hangs over everything. 
It does. And not to get too off the beaten track, my, I, I just finished my next book um, and I really got into the health of it I'll, I'll, because we think about heart health, lung health, liver health. What connects all that? We don't think about vagus nerve health. Hmm. But if the vagus nerve is not healthy, it's going to affect how our heart beats, how we breathe, the liver. And it's very digestive. It's very much part of the digestive process. We, we, we can't process anything uh, without the vagus nerve. So the vagus nerve is the largest autonomic nerve in our body, as you just showed everybody. But that's a 16th century lithograph, by the way. That's just the coolest. That's what I have back here. I usually have it, have it up here. And by autonomic, I, I know what it means, but I want to hear the-, the It means automatic. Yeah. Okay. Right? Just autonomic means automatic. So if you hear autonomic, it means automatic. And think about automatically our heartbeats, automatically our lungs are breathing, automatically our digestion is happening. We're not thinking about it. It's just happening. Thank you, vagus nerve. What and does the vagus nerve have to do with those? This is, um, it connects to every major organ in our body and it connects to everything that functions in our body, even up into the larynx, into our throat, into our middle ear. This is what gets really cool in here. Um, so this nerve, I mean, we literally cannot live without that nerve. Um, it makes everything work. Now, you heard me say polyvagal theory. This is where I try not to get too psychobabbly. Um, but the polyvagal theory for us therapists came online and we were going, oh my gosh, this totally makes sense. Stephen Porges, you guys can look that up if you want to go uh, do a little bit more research. Through his theory says that the vagus nerve is the nerve that keeps us safe, right? Just basic safety. That nerve is the wiring that's out there going, are we safe? Are we not safe? We're talking about trauma. Is it safe? Is it not safe? Because it, it initiates the fight or flight syndrome. Yeah. So there's three branches of safety, not the, not the bilaterals in here. There's three branches of safety. It's all you have to worry about. Mobility, immobility, and safety. That's what, you know, and none of the, neither, none of those are bad. They, they just are what they are. We, we apply meaning to them, especially if we had early childhood trauma and we were constantly in a state, you know, fight or flight. We're constantly over so-called overreacting because what I loved as a trauma therapist is I would see clients that were so-called overreacting in, in situations, but it was kind of a physical reaction. It was a neurobiological reaction, right? It was a poof that spreads through their nervous system. That's why trauma therapists started to really embrace Stephen Porges's work. Like, yeah, it's not because emotion, this has always been my pet peeve. Emotion comes from our soul. These overreactions come from our biology that is designed to keep us safe but can get a little skewed when it's been overused. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So within that, yes, just like you were saying, Suzanne, it's, we have the sympathetic, which is, that's the mo mobility. I like my mobility. I get up every morning and I walk it, right? Because that's how we work through when we're anxious, when we're just, you know, restless, we can work through that. Children use that mobility a lot. They also use a safety branch when they're playing. That's how they communicate. Right? Kids can't sit still. There's nothing wrong with that. They got to go. They're moving. They're intuitively, you know, just rolling around and playing with each other and laughing and engaging. So that's two branches right there, safety and mobility. That third branch, the immobility, is not bad, although it gets a little, it gets a bad rap. Immobility is shutting down. Immobility, that's, that's, I call it the back. It's, it's dorsal vagal, right? It's the most ancient branch. Immobility is when, when you watch those, um, uh, I'm, I'm dating myself, 
Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I can remember that. There might be a few, few listeners going, wait, what is she talking about? Just those wild animal, um, you know, usually in Africa, kind of wild animal um, videos. You'd see the, the, the leopard catch the antelope and the antelope would collapse. Then the leopard would drop the antelope thinking the antelope was dead and the antelope would get up and run. That's a dorsal vagal response. That's a too much, too much stress. Possum, possums do that. And then they get up and they go away. We can do that too sometimes if we get overly stimulated, overly uh, exhausted. Sometimes we just can't, we just can't get off the couch. So it's just the three branches of safety. So immobility, mobility, and safety. So we're, I don't want to get too far down in the weeds here. I want to get to the practical stuff. How do we use this to help ourselves? Just by noticing. Hmm. That's why I just bring up those three. None of them are wrong. We go back and forth all day long, right? Um, right before you came on, I was like, I'm, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a little in my mobility and my safety, right? I'm about to sit here and talk to, to, to Suzanne. So it's okay. We have these experiences. If we just identify them all day long, we know what, what's going on in our body. We know how our body's reading a situation. Then we can be gentler to ourselves. We can be kinder. We can say, oh, look at I'm getting a little, ooh, getting a little of this. I'm going to breathe. Because breathing is the most important thing we can do to calm ourselves. And we could repeat that one again. Yeah, the vagus nerve breathing that I teach is simply exhaling longer than you inhale very slowly to put pressure on the vagus nerve to initiate the opposite effect, the relaxation response instead of fight or flight. So it does both, yep. the vagus nerve, right? It gets you wound up, but it will, will also calm you down. And you're saying also use the breathing for that. Yeah, we always want to work our way back to safety. You know, we, we always do. In fact, to do the spiritual work, our body has to be in that safety zone. You know, you're, I think you're doing a class right now on, on that utilizing the body at, at, at the ship network, right? Um, we have to be in our safety zone to feel that connection to self energy, soul, and any guides around us. Any kind of spiritual work requires us being safe here. And that's why sometimes people get a little struggle with that if they're feeling a little anxious and they'll try to dissociate around it, you know, to connect to spirit. Just getting safe in our bodies helps us be more soulful. Has our soul be able to guide us more, less than our body. But our body is going to take over if some scary guy comes out of the, you know, out of the shadows with a gun. Our body's going to say, forget you, we're going, <laughs> we're mm -hmm. keeping you safe. Mm -hmm. So our, that's the balance. That's the tension that we seem to have just as humans, right? We're having this human experience. We come in and we experience this tension. And if we can just be calmer and, and kinder to ourselves, more mindful, you, you use the term, what was it sort of backing up and looking at the larger picture? What was, was this watching the perspective? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Just to take that perspective, what's really going on? Oh, okay, this is going on, I'm gonna breathe. It just is management. It's management of our human self, right? The nervous system, yeah. Yes, yes. Absolutely. So now relate that to the chakras. Okay. What's the big aha you had with vagus nerve and chakras? You talked about seeing how they're related, but I, didn't, I don't get it yet. So I see them align, they align. Yogis talk about, you know, if you go back and read some of the ancient work uh, around chakra centers, there's a lot that discusses just sort of the alignment of nerves, right, around the chakras. Uh, the chakras align with the nerves. But back then, you know, they didn't have medical research to be able to say, well, look at that. There's this, there's that. They just knew it intuitively. So within the alignment of the chakras, um, I break it down into two aspects. The lower, they're not lesser, but the lower chakras, the root chakra, 
the sacral chakra, the solar plexus are associated a little bit more with that, all the nerves that are below the diaphragm, right? Those are a lot more sympathetic. And in this diagram in the book, there are a lot more of those afferent nerves, the ones that kind yep. of hang down yep. than up. Why? Yeah. Okay. You're probably going to talk about why that is. Well, but you talk about the digestion. That's that very much that's, that's attaching to the lower intestines, the upper intestines, the liver. Um, in fact, the liver provides, all right, I'll just geek out on this one thing. Cause I just discovered this. I thought it was the coolest thing. Acetylcholine is our biggest nerve neurotransmitter. It, it allows the transmission of information. The only form of choline we get in our body to apply that was through the nerve uh, through the liver. Uh, there was just a little geek on my part. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, there's a lot of these lower diaphragmatic nerves down in here that have very basic functionings of digestion. They're very connected to sympathetic and they're very connected to mobility and immobility. And the connection with the chakras then, our safety, security, relationship chakras are the lower yes. three. The root, yeah, the sacral. This is the, like, the, it's it's the body, it's the emotion through early childhood connections, and it's the mind through who is my identity. It's sort of like we're growing up up here, right? These are the ones that come online first as we're kids. Then we get into the safety branch. And I keep wanting to do this. So the safety branch is above the diaphragm. It moves faster, it's coded, it moves faster. It's connected to the heart, it's connected to the lungs, it's connected to the throat. This is what we get into when we start doing our spiritual work up in here. The information moves faster. When you are talking about breathing, um, one of the, yes, absolutely, that low exhale, that slow exhale, I call it the flute breath, just for people to kind of get the image. What you're doing is you're lowering your heart rate and you're increasing the beat between the beats. It's not just lowering your heart rate, but the beat, then the beat. There's more space between them. That lowers the blood pressure, right? It's it's helping the lungs just kind of calm. It's, everything's coming down. Yes. Yeah, so this part, the safety part, starts connecting to the heart, heart chakra. This is the soul nerve. This is what we try to back, you know, we breathe to re-engage with our safety portion of our nerve. Throat. Um, technically, there's there's no chakras up in here, but I've seen the times that I've seen energy, like physically seen it lately as, an, as a grown-up, um, the throat chakra connects up to the ears because listening and speaking are part of how we feel safe with each other. So here's the throat chakra. And then we get into third eye and crown, which don't technically align with the, the, the vagus nerve, but they have their own connections through the, the ocular nerves. Right? When, we do bio, when we do EMDR, right? The back and forth, or you have REM sleep. When your eyes are going back and forth, it's calming the brain, which is sending signals down to the nervous system. That bilateral, that's the walking. We want to get up every morning and do the one side, then the other. Calms us. All right, did I lose you? <laughs> well, I'm still just not getting my aha moment about the chakras and the vagus. Well, okay, so your subtitle, tap into the healing combination of subtle energy. Okay. Nervous system. So what's in it for those who are listening and watching? Why do we want? about this combination so because first of all they're one and the same i started off the book and i started thinking no these aren't separate systems one is the etheric experience that's coming through the nervous system does that make sense mm -hmm. you know so when i talk to energy worker people they think chakras are a system and that nervous system is not a thing okay right mm -hmm. But it's exactly what you were talking about in your book. When we know that this is a nervous system adjustment, that we can slowly breathe out through our mouths, we are adjusting to safety in our nervous system. We are accessing more readily this energy center in this case, 
throat chakra, third eye chakra, because the rest of our body is also calm. I'm, you can't see my hands. I'm kind of going down to my belly. So the energy aligns with how these uh, nerve centers sort of, um, I almost need to get it. I, I need to get like a, a graph or something. They align with how the nerves kind of present through uh, sideways. We look at it sideways. And then if we know, oh, this is the experience of these chakras that I'm having are still the experience I'm having in my nervous system. So I, so then like the vagus nerve breath, we are using our physiology to affect also our non-physical health and openness. Is that yep. correct? That would absolutely, that's a great way to put it. Yes. And I, I, I feel when we clear our trauma and those are the denser fields, some, you know, energy workers will say, well, I can clear the trauma from the uh, etheric energy, but you're not really permanently clearing it until you get into the denser energies in the nervous system. Okay. I'll give you an example. I have, and I have an amazing energy worker who's in Australia. That is mine personal, my personal one. And she works with trauma therapists. And so I've done a lot of my own trauma work through the years. I've done my own EMDR, my own internal family systems. Um, I, I am different internally. My, my neurobiological responses, I'm not going you know, to certain things anymore. You can feel that difference. But she cleared my energy field. If she had cleared my energy field first, I'd still have those those responses and because they're stored in my nervous system. So I feel my, you know, my premise is dense to lighter right. in regards to clearing it out. So how is this what your book gets into then how to clear the physical energy system? So I have to be careful with that because in order to do actual trauma work, you really need the containment of a therapist and a therapist's office because there's all sorts of layers to this. We don't want to re-traumatize somebody. Um, I, I know someone who got a massage, who has a lot of trauma in his body, got a massage. That massage therapist is like, oh, here, let me hit you here and here and here. And my client was like, just totally triggered, right? So you have to do the deeper trauma work from the actual events in the containment of a therapist's office. However, us grounding ourselves, us becoming aware, us knowing when we're having a trauma response. That's why I was like, I don't have a problem with anybody using, oh, I just got triggered. Oh, just breathe into that. Notice what that trigger is. Notice what triggered you. Is it a thinking? Is it something outside of your environment that you feel threatened by? Just notice it. Because then you can take that into the tra the, to a, a trauma therapist and get into the deeper work in that regard but us learning how to manage our system whether it's pre-trauma work during or after is really vital uh, because we can not shame ourselves if we overreact to something oh look at how that. about in the moment of trauma um uh i remember in, in my book still right here right in the opening pages i, I relate how i walked out in the campground and came face to face, three feet away with a giant rattlesnake reared up at me. And from that moment on, until I reached out to a trauma therapist for the next few days, I didn't want to set foot outside. Yes. That, that fight or flight syndrome. Yep. What would you say to somebody who has an in the moment trauma? What's the best way to deal with that? So, it's so just, uh, right. Well, you're, you're, that's where you trust your body, right? You, you didn't reach forward. <laughs> right you probably froze your body went yeah this is how we do it mm -hmm. and so your your central nervous system froze you yep yeah, but then how do you clear it yourself afterwards then i would say in that case because you were shut you were you, you went into freeze mode working your way through breath through movement this is why it's important just to kind of know what's happening in our bodies Oh, I need to stretch this out, right? I'm in freeze mode. I need to slowly work my way back into mobility. 
and then slowly work my way back into safety. That's where it takes that um, awareness and intention. And then you went and got some processing on that, <laughs> right? Yeah. That's a that's a a really good question because it, in the moment somebody else might have run. Well, I, after I noticed after I noticed the, the snake wasn't coming after me, I shrieked. Nobody came to help me because they all had their air conditioners on. They couldn't hear me. And then the snake didn't move. So I ran like hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. <laughs> that whole time you just trusted your body. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it was definitely the deep breathing that helped, just like you said, but also talking to the my brain and saying, you can relax now. You're safe with the deep breathing. Yep. And so then, the breathing kind of brought you down and it, and it doesn't, we don't just jump right back into safety after we've had that experience. It takes us a minute. Sometimes it takes us imagining moving again mm. to get our body moving. Cause that's just, that's, I just refer to it as neurobiology. There's emotion in there somewhere. There's fear, <laughs> maybe a little anger that no one came to help you. <laughs> But it's kind of mixed up in the in the the moment of your body just jumped into the zone to keep yourself safe. Um, I've had a couple of clients. This is this is um, this is a military story. Uh, I had a, a client who uh, his first he was uh, in the army, and his first he was on the front lines in the first battle he ever went into. He said, "I was so embarrassed. I I, I wet my pants." And he said, I'm trying to figure out why I've been trained all this time. I knew what to do and I'm running and I'm, I'm wetting my pants. And I said, that's because you had a dorsal vagal response. Hmm. In other words, you had, you were trained to run into danger, right? Um, but your body naturally wanted to shut down and get out of there. So huh. your body that immobility branch released all those those fibers we were just looking at released sometimes people you know poop their pants in those situations that's why it's automatic isn't it yeah 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 and so that helped when we had that conversation he felt so much better about himself right because of what he was trained to do he's like this is embarrassing i feel like a three-year-old this was your biology Mm -hmm. You did what you were trained to do, and you probably weren't the only one that that wet their pants in that moment the first time out. But it was your it was your neurobiology doing that, and mm -hmm. so that takes the shame out of stuff like that too. Uh huh. That's that's, a, that's an, a you know a military sort of extreme um, niche experience, but it's still what happens to us. What is the the greatest takeaway from well from your book Chakras in the Vagus Nerve? So my greatest takeaway is uh, just observe yourself, be patient with yourself, really inform yourself that we have this human body and it's designed to keep us safe. And that within it, we have this amazing soul. And sometimes the human body is like, no, 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 we're not going anywhere, but this, our soul is going, no, we want this thing. We want to go and experience and so body is like, no, 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 we've seen, we've been here too much. We're gonna stay put. So we end up with this tension. First of all, be okay with the tension, right? Understand where it's coming from so we can heal it. If it's hardcore trauma, or if it's just our natural body saying, I really want to experience that bungee jump. <laughs> my soul really wants to feel that. But my body says, no, you know, that's just a. Oh, I had that experience and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> what What was the rest of that? I cut you off there. What was the rest? Of what were you going to say about no, that? No, I was just. That's funny because I wouldn't do the same thing either. It was. This was in uh, New Zealand, and they happened to have a bar right there at the edge of the cliff. <laughs> you know, if, if I have to get drunk to jump off the cliff, I don't think I'm going to go there. <laughs> no, no, it's so not worth it. My soul wants a lot of other experiences other than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All righty. So you, I just find it funny. I, I have to say your last name, Llewellyn, and your publisher is Llewellyn. And I asked you about that in advance and that there's no connection there. 
there's no connection. That's a God thing. (laughs) It's, it it was, and they were very open to the idea. I was, I will share this. My, my publisher, very, uh, adaptive body mind and also chakras. So she saw immediately, she understood immediately the connection. So that was great. That was, that was fun to work with someone who went, I get this. I I'm getting this correlation here. Well, I had a physicist email me once and say that my massage therapist told me all about these chakras, but I can't find any proof that they exist. (laughs) And my, my answer to him was, and you probably won't, but work with them, use them. Like I have a chakra clearing exercise on my website, and now you have this book about them and see if that makes a difference for you. Is it helpful? Is it healing? Do you have any stories of people working with their chakras and how that has helped them? So actually the one thing that was coming to my mind, I'm thinking, oh, okay, I'll use, I'll keep there. I have a dear friend who is a geneticist and an oral surgeon, very Harvard, you know, very, whose, whose children are getting into Ayurvedic medicine. So he's like, I don't even understand this. He's also been someone that I've referred to help me with just, I want to clarify the medical aspects of this. So as he's been, just as I, he's sort of my medical reference person and um, he's starting to understand it. It's like, oh my gosh. So when you feel this, this is happening. And it, it took him help me just sort of helping the medical parts through my book to have him understand this is experiential. This, you can't think this through. Now it's an experience. Have well, give us some examples of the experiences one can have as a result of the chakras. Okay. Um, let me think. So I think one of the strong ones that nobody likes to have, but we all have, is the experience of that solar plexus flaring up. Right? How many of us have had to go in for a test? How many of us have had to sit in rush hour traffic and we are feeling it right here. That is the solar plexus sort of overcharging and registering. So think about holding a puppy, hmm. right? Or a baby. Think about holding that a sweet, uh, just being that you are rocking, right? Cats, dogs, whatever. Even as you are thinking about it, and just asking all your views, just drop down into the puppy, the baby, the, the kitten, whatever, just your loved one. And notice where you're feeling that right now in your body, even as you're just imagining it. More than likely, you're opening up through your heart chakra. You're feeling that opening in there. Um, think about a time that you felt very grateful that someone did something for you, right? Just a moment of of something, somebody doing something really just nice and profound, even in its simplicity. Whatever the the image is, whatever the experience is, just reach for that in your mind. And just notice where you're feeling it in your body. And where you're experiencing that in the body right now are where you're experiencing your chakric energies. It's funny. Yesterday I was out for a walk. I was about two miles from home and I got a text from a friend who said that uh, her business partner and dear friend had just passed Mm -hmm. and she couldn't stop crying. And just before she called me, I was listening to this gorgeous song I'd never heard before. I just downloaded a whole album. And I texted her, I said, step outside in five minutes. I'm going to be walking past your house. And I I walked by her house and she's on the porch. And I just walked up. I said, may I touch you? She said, yeah. And I put my hand right here. Then I put another one on her back. I popped my earbuds in her ears, turned that song up. And we just swayed together. To me, it felt the most natural thing. I knew she was getting a healing. And it was only later that I thought, Anybody driving by would have thought, what are those two women doing? <laughs> but to me, what's was, happening over there? <laughs> it was just this soul thing that I, 
you know, when, when somebody reaches out and you just happen to be going by their house with this gorgeous song and, and know that we can help each other. And of course, the, the hand goes to the heart, that, that, that love center there. That there, love and safety. Yeah, yeah, love and safety. Well, there's definitely something to this. Your book, unfortunately, it just arrived. That's why I'm questioning and grilling oh. you because I haven't had a chance to read it yet. It arrived last night, a little bit late. Also, what arrived are these beautiful flowers from you. I'll, I'll, I'll thank you on the air. They're so sweet. I uh, actually saw them earlier. I, went, I wonder if those are them. <laughs> I have to tell you, that's another God thing because I had a reading with a shaman, a session with a shaman, because I love, I love energy healers and energy workers two nights ago. And she said, you need to surround yourself with flowers. And I thought, I need to get out and get some flowers and they show up at my door. So thank you, CJ. And oh thank- my gosh, you're so <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Just like the whole web. Everybody, when you listen to your body, like CJ has been saying, when you work on the stuff, the dense energy in yourself and let it come to the surface, things do start flowing again, literally in your body, right? CJ, in the in and in, in the immaterial body, the energy body. And then it's reflected in the outside world. Absolutely. At that in a nutshell right there. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, 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 my chakras, I have a whole chapter in my book on energetic hygiene uh, because we don't think about clearing our energy body. We wash our bodies every day, but not the energy body. So. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Magnesium is one of my favorites. Okay, my mouth just dropped up because there's the third ding, ding, ding. Somebody else, Sherry Smith, who's in one of my Moment of Truth videos, reached out and she said, you know, I think you could use some magnesium because you're channeling all these higher energies. So I just started taking it yesterday. <laughs> it, it absolutely, I will take it. And then I will also put it on my body in, in the shower. Huh. It just, it to me, it's the elixir of the gods or the goddesses. You know, it just, something about it just clears everything. Well, cool. And then I guess we, do we need any kind of disclaimer that no medical advice here, blah, blah, No blah. medical advice here. No medical. Ad- yes. <laughs> That's a supplement, right? Okay. Yes, it's a supplement. Yes. You, so you have a, you, what is it? You, you have one of those um, free hour events with the shift network coming up. What is the topic of this one? I love it. I had to print it out. Connect your soul's desire with your chakras and vagus nerve. And it's coming up Thursday, March 7th at uh, 10 a.m. Pacific time. So that's wow. my free, my free. Well, tell us about that though. Connection so it's, desire. Yeah. Well, that, that speaks to everything we're just talking about. When we can, when we can calm our body, when we can clear those data sets so, that get kind of programmed in here, we can lead more with our soul. And it's the etheric energy around our body that is the soul right i mean it's representative of this this higher wiser energy that that is our soul so yes that's that's my whole if we can just help our bodies clear some of this stuck energy stuck trauma in our nervous system we can listen more easily and and those those free events usually have a guided practice what are you going to be showing us how to do I'm going to do, if I can do it all in an hour, one of the things that I want to do is have um, everybody break down, we'll we'll do this uh, together, experience the chakras, but allowing each chakra to communicate up. Because we think we got to communicate down. We we think we got to tell the body what to do. No, the wisdom is in our body because our soul is in our body. So I'm going to, uh, that's one of the things that I'm really looking forward to is really breaking that down uh, for people in that to really be able to listen. What is, what is this center sharing with you? And then what is this center and listen to it, make space for it because there is your specific wisdom. It's different for everybody. Very cool. So we'll put a link. If you're watching this on YouTube versus listening on a podcast, go to the YouTube video description for this episode and there'll be a link to sign up for that free event if you missed it the links usually work afterwards as well so that's good because that'll be available for a while so super any parting wisdom for everybody about 
Anything we've been discussing? I, I just really want to encourage people to uh, be kinder to themselves in general and, and uh, make space enough to not judge. Just be curious with yourself. We, we just judge ourselves so badly. We judge our bodies like, like they're separate. And right now, they're the vehicle. They're the vehicle that's getting us through this experience. So be kind. Be kind to yourself. And of course, we'll be kind to others. Right? Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I love how you said, watch about making that distinction that the body is separate from the soul, two different systems, the vagus nerve and the chakras, when it's really just all working together. So that's the connection that I, that's what I take from this. You've made the connection that, you know, I recognize they work together and you're going to be, everything will flow more smoothly. Yeah. Yeah. And just be curious and kind. Okay. Beautiful. Thank you so much, CJ, for joining us. I hope you all have enjoyed this and check out her book. Your website is what? My, my new website is thehealingsolution.co. I'm going to be uploading some, um, some workshops that are going to be more uh, actual body mind workshops here shortly, you know, cause I got a book going and the workshops, going, <laughs> but, but that will be up here shortly too. So we'll be able to have some more access to ways to work through some of this energy we're talking about. Excellent. You know, this, it sounds like a lot of work to work on ourselves, but I I'm sure you found like I have that every little bit of, of thoughts that are not aligned with our soul that we can clear out just by looking at them, like you said, with kindness and curiosity, they go away. And the more they clear out, that just makes room for more of this beautiful life force energy to shine through us. So yes. thank you for that. Thank you for helping us. To, thank uh, you, Suzanne. I appreciate it. All right. Okay, everybody. Take it to heart and come back here next week. We'll see you again. Hope this was helpful. We love you all so much. Thanks for being part of the community.